Hands down, the best way to level up your game as a security researcher is by watching other security engineers go through an audit, open up a new code base, and seeing how they approach a brand new audit. But of course, it can be hard to get the chance to peek over the shoulder of a fellow auditor as they go about their business. So of course, this is why I made this series in which I live audit a real smart contract system for Filecoin alongside one of their research engineers, Dennis, who has nearly two decades of experience in cybersecurity and subsequently blockchain technology. And as we're going through this series, we're going through this code base, you have exactly all the same context that I do. And Dennis is explaining to us how the system works as we go. So last episode, we went through all of the remainder of the validator logic, and we left off right before we started to dig into how subnets communicate with their parent network. And so in this episode, we're going to dive into this checkpointing logic. Dennis is going to help us understand how it works from a high level. And then we're going to actually dig into the code, see how this actually ends up getting implemented and try to find some nice, juicy bugs and vulnerabilities with it. But first, before we get into things, of course, my name is Owen and over a year and a half ago, I founded Guardian Audits. And since then, we've uncovered dozens and dozens and dozens of critical and high vulnerabilities where easily over 500 plus findings at this point in time. And I've personally easily spent at least a thousand hours, perhaps even 2000 hours at this point, auditing smart contracts. And my goal with all of these videos and especially this series is to distill down everything that I've learned, all of my experiences from those 2000 hours and give them to you so that you can ultimately become a much, much better security engineer or blockchain developer or whatever it is that you would like to be in a fraction of the time. All right, so without further ado, let's dive into this live audit. Okay, so in this session, we're going to audit the implementation of the checkpoint protocol in Solidity and uh, we should say that checkpoint protocol is the core mechanism of the interplanetary consensus system uh, because it's a protocol that provides security guarantees for uh, subnet users. And uh, uh, the goal, the goal of a checkpoint protocol is to uh, commit a state, a state of, of the subnet of the subnet into its parent subnet, its parent subnet. And uh, so we can think about a checkpoint is just a root of the, for example, uh, as a root of a Merkle tree for the subnet. And we wanted to store information about checkpoint protocols for security reasons. Uh, the example, an example for that is, let's say, uh, after uh, emergency in the subnet, after attack, for example, uh, users of subnet can decide what is the last state of the of the subnet was correct as a social consensus, for example. That's a very bad example, but <laughs> we, we we could use this uh, checkpoint information to restore the state because the parent net is more secure than a child subnet by design by design because of that uh, the probability of compromising of the par consensus of the parent subnet uh, is lower than the probability of compromising the child the consensus protocol in the subnet uh, so we store uh, checkpoints for target epochs and of course each subnet can can decide uh, how how often we are going to store checkpoints of uh, child subnet in the parent so let's say uh, subnet a can store checkpoint each 10 epochs and subnet b can store uh, the checkpoint of the checkpoints uh, each th 32 epochs. 
and uh, checkpoint checkpoints contain meta information something like subnet id epoch numbers uh parent uh parent uh, subnet last checkpoint hash and, and so on and uh, uh according to the parent design of the protocol checkpoint also checkpoint message as a structure also uh contains cross messages that can be sent uh, from from one subnet to another subnet and those subnets can be arbitrary checkpoint protocol is implemented by several components so uh validators of each subnet ipc and a special component called apc agent uh, we can think about ipc agent as a daemon that ha that has access to a, to a nodes in parent and in parent subnet in a child subnet and can get access to different data structures so it's a kind of orchestrator orchestrator to do things like a join leave network uh, kill network and it also implements checkpoint protocol from implementation perspective and also we have two actors uh subnet actor and uh, gateway actor so and um, uh, these three are main components for a checkpoint protocol and also actually for all other sub protocols and sub mechanisms. And so the, the, on this slide, you can see just the high level overview of a checkpoint protocol. And uh, so mm, let's, let's discuss that. So we have two subnets rootnet and the child subnet a and uh, in the rootnet we have a subnet actor for subnet a we have gateway actor and i should uh, remind that in each network there is only one gateway actor and gateway actor is implemented is implemented by the provider the infrastructure provider and but subnet actor can be implement is implemented by a subnet owner subnet users so in each network we have only one gateway actor but we have many subnet actors one subnet actor per each subnet we wanted to use uh and of course uh, in a child in a child subnet a we have a gateway actor and uh, because in this case we don't have child subnets of child of a subnet a there are no subnet actors in this state to, so if i'm a user and uh, i want to participate in this uh network i have to run a node for this blockchain for this network and a node a full node for this subnet and uh, i also have to run apc agent apc agent and apc agent has access to my private key in these two uh, networks and it uh, will provide will uh, orchestrate all all actions i would uh, have to do if I would participate in this infrastructure manually without APC agent. So it's kind of automation and orchestration. Okay, so uh, we have uh, two subnets, root, root network and child network, and uh, uh, we have three components that will be will be participating in the, in the checkpoint protocol. Okay, so what is the flow? What is the overview of the flow? So APC agent, monitors subnet c for checkpoint epoch so let's say the configuration for subnet c is that we uh, should commit checkpoint every four epochs and uh, apc agent apc agent uh, anal analyzes the current state the current uh, block heights and if you see that the height of the block is 
let's say four four eight and so on it will trigger the next action so if we see that this is the epoch four checkpoint then uh the first thing ipc agent is go is going to do is check if this validator is a validator at epoch at this epoch because maybe maybe our validator is not a validator right uh, and uh, so there is a mechanism called membership and uh, validators can be rotated and for different set of epochs we can have different set of validators so uh, only validators participate in checkpoint protocol so if the validator is a validator at epoch at the target epoch then it builds checkpoint message checkpoint date and uh ipc agent ipc agent uh, has access to this data and it can submit checkpoint to the subnet actor to the subnet actor of subnet C on parent network by calling submit checkpoint method. So uh, IPC agent calls submit checkpoint method located in this subnet act. Then, so this, these steps are uh, implementation details of this method we are going to uh, analyze. Uh, in one minute so uh, we call we call this method basic idea what this method does is that it waits for a threshold votes from all other APC agent APC agents and if we get that number of votes let's say two-third of votes of APC agent, then we call commit child check. And that commit child check is a method of gateway act located in the, in, in according to the, our, our slides here. So this subnet actor calls commit child check of this gateway actor. And uh, this method checks that checkpoint is valid uh it creates a child checkpoint for this subnet because uh gateway actor serves many subnets it updates circulation supply to enforce to be able to enforce a firewall mechanism protecting parent network forms from subnet uh, from subnets and apply all messages if their destination is this network so if messages are sent from subnet to root network then uh gateway actor applies all those messages if not then it forwards all these messages to other subnets to child subnets to target child subnets and it, it distributes rewards among uh target validators that that were participating in this checkpoint protocol. Okay, does it, does it does it make sense? Yeah, and just a clarifying question on that distribute rewards. When you say distribute to the validators, it would be the particular validators that were active in that past epoch, correct? Yeah, yeah, that should be the case. But okay. I'm sure that uh, the current implementation considers that. Yeah, I believe that all validators will get rewards. Yeah. And then, yeah, one thing I think it would be helpful just to reiterate, like you said, exactly the, the IPC agent, that's essentially just a validator, right? That's the software, the daemon that basically orchestrates a validator doing this process between the subnet and the, the actor in the parent net. It's a separate process. Yeah, so it's a, a daemon are, that has yeah. the private key of the validator. It has access to to API of the two nodes in our mm -hmm. case and to uh, to private key. Yeah. 
Yeah. So in my mind, the way I'm thinking about it is like, it's, it's almost like automating a validator, right? To be able to read from the subnet. And then when we need to commit this stuff to, you know, a checkpoint in the parent, then we've just automated that and we'll have the validator do that automatically using this daemon process. You can think about it as a front end. Mm -hmm. And so in this, in this case, IPC agent is a front end and it has access to two backends. Mm -hmm. And uh, those backends are two full nodes one full node for root network and another one for subnet. And it can access API and it, it can call, let's say, chain head method. I don't get, to get the head of the chain check the height of the last block, get all messages, and so on and so on. It can also uh, analyze the state the state of a subnet actor because actually, so for example, let's say in this step, uh, APC agent checks whether our validator is a validator in in this epoch or not but there are there is no such method in subnet actor or in in a gateway actor and it gets it gets the current validator set using internal api those methods are not provided in the solid yeah and i imagine there are checks also within the contracts to validate and we'll see in a second to validate that the validator is a validator for this epoch? Yeah, there are no such checks in Solid. <laughs> okay, so it's that doesn't necessarily... But that's not a vulnerability because uh, those checks are in the code of, of IPC agent. But couldn't somebody run like an arbitrary implementation of IPC agent? Uh, IPC agent is provided by us, by, by I mean, by provided... Provided. So subnet actor from users, gateway, and APC agent from us. So it, it so this is our responsibility to implement APC agent, agent correct. Okay, I see. But so I mean, like on from purely an on-chain perspective, you can't guarantee that any validator address is going to act in any certain way, right? Like you can because. Uh, membership protocol there is another protocol called membership and validator all validators uh vote for the next validator oh i see okay so i was thinking that i could just become a validator by um calling that function on the you can join the network but that doesn't mean that you're your validator at the next epoch you can join the network. So, if, but if you join the network, it is not enough to be a validator. I, in this case, by validator, we mean something that really uh, proposes blocks or votes for blocks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So that's distinct from just, you know, yeah. calling the function, providing yeah. collateral. Yes. Yeah, so when we join the network, and we were our validator was added into a validator set. That means that it can be a validator in the next epoch, or Got maybe, it. or maybe all validators are permanent validators because that's up to the subnet. That's up to subnet policy. Maybe they are not going to use consensus with a dynamically validator set, right? Got it. So when something becomes like a validator that's using this IPC agent, we we are basically assuming that it is a valid implementation of IPC agent yeah. that comes from from you guys. Okay. Yeah. So, but if if it's necessary, then we have a mechanism that uh, can you that IPC agent can use to get validators set. It can get active validators, real validators for each epoch. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Yeah, thanks for clearing that up. I guess one other clarifying question that might be helpful is, so we talk about these this idea of checkpoints and this idea of cross messages. Now, these two things are different, but they have the same 
um, windows in which they're propagated. Is that correct? Uh, there are two window windows because there are two two subnets. Yeah. So I'm meaning like okay. So we have this one window from epoch 100 to epoch 200. We we I believe we will not see these windows in a solidity. Actually. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no. No. Sorry, we will see it in the voting contract. There is a voting contract that uh, that counts votes for each checkpoint. Yeah, and we will see uh, this this period there probably. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. So, so the checkpoints they you know we aggregate all of the state changes over you know one of these time windows, and then the checkpointed is you know persisted up to the parent. We also sort of build up all these cross messages during that same period, right? And then at the end of the checkpoint period, at the same time, these cross messages get propagated up or down or wherever they need to go. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, great. And so they sort of, I know there's, so there's a whole bunch of different logic just for cross messages and there's like a, a post box and, and stuff like this to yeah. basically facilitate that propagation you know whether it goes up or down or whatever the route is. Yeah, uh, but uh, post messages are not are not post message post box is not a part of checkpoint protocol. It's yeah, like yeah. cross cross uh, net messaging protocol. Okay, great. All and right, propagation method is also about uh, cross net messaging. Okay, so I think we can we can jump in and we can look. We can start off at the checkpoint. Uh, yeah, where do you think it would be best? Do you think it would be best to start in the subnet actor or yeah. the gateway? I I would start with with a submit checkpoint function, and uh, then so I would analyze the code by the using the flow, the same using the same flow. Okay, so this is a submit checkpoint in the subnet actor, and uh, the we can look at the structure bottom up checkpoint so as i as i said there is a subnet id there is a source subnet epoch number fee cross optional cross messages and they're transmitted inside checkpoint message children checkpoints and previous hash so children checkpoint right because that subnet that is sending bottom up checkpoint maybe not a leaf subnet it also that, that that's that checkpoint message can aggregate can aggregate child checkpoint message okay i see here also there's a top down checkpoint we don't have to go entirely into that yeah, but top down checkpoint carries only cross messages okay that that makes sense exactly so okay i was wondering because you know checkpoints are always just go to the parent so why would we have a top down that makes sense okay okay and uh, <coughs> we there is a modifier called valid epoch only. Okay, so if the epoch's before the last, then it's invalid. So this has to be a current epoch. Okay, yeah. So the logic here is that if this message from the previous epoch mm -hmm. and we executed, so let's say, cross net uh, checkpoint message for this epoch then we should ignore that message. Mm -hmm. we, we already have got enough votes for this epoch. We executed the message and we can do much with that, can do much with uh, that message. So we should ignore it, right? <clears throat> and so this is the check that we, let's say the submission, submission period is four and uh, the epoch number is three right so in this case we also should this epoch number is invalid okay what if i just a initial thought what if i submitted an epoch that was let's say this is before there is any initial last voting execution executed epoch so let's say let's assume that's zero so we don't have to worry about that first check and then in the second check in in 40 we see if epoch is greater than genesis epoch and then we go on to the next condition and the next condition is basically saying that it is one of these valid like 
um, ends of the the previous period or something like this, right? What if I submit like a totally invalid epoch that is before the Genesis epoch? And so it seems like that might pass this valid epoch only modifier only when that last voting execution epoch is zero or uninitialized. Uh, do you mean that if, uh, let's say, Genesis epoch is 10 and we and last voting this uh, variable is zero and we send the epoch number uh, eight, right? Sure, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, yeah, I believe that here we need or, right, or another if statement because, yeah, actually we can uh, send the epoch number before Genesis epoch. Yeah, maybe, and I'm not sure, maybe that's covered elsewhere, but just looking at this, if we're validating an epoch, certainly we would not want it to be before the, the Genesis. Okay, yeah, makes sense. Yeah, and ultimately, I imagine that probably doesn't have any huge consequences, but like I'm imagining it would just go on to revert for a different reason, but just something that... Um, yeah, but if, if we uh, say that after this modifier, only valid epoch, epochs will be processed, right, then we should also check yeah. that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. That's good. Okay, and the uh, signable only, it's about accounts. We checked it before. Mm -hmm. I mean, we uh, looked at that modifier. Okay, so uh, submit checkpoint. First, we check that uh, status of the network is active and the uh, sender of the message is in the validator set and uh, we don't check that the, this is an active validator. We just check that this sender is a validator set. So actually, we check that this sender has a stake. In yeah, our they've provided enough collateral to get over that threshold. Uh, then we check the name of the subnet. Source is a, is a source name, subnet, subnet name. And uh, I believe that in... in if I remember correctly, there is a bug in a GitHub GitHub that says that we can uh, create a constant for that, and uh, we don't need to to uh, mm -hmm. yeah compute every time every time every because submit checkpoint we call submit checkpoint very often. We it's not the method we called once and that's it. So uh, there is a optimization behind it okay i see so are you guys concerned with like really optimizing this function or is that just like a minor i, I was basic optimization okay because okay. <laughs> yeah i see a couple things that you know i mean there's a trade-off always with optimization and readability but of course like on line 237 i don't think we ever use that boolean again we could presumably like just move that that function called directly into the if and then we don't have to allocate another stack variable but of course you know there's always a trade-off with readability and, mm -hmm. and optimization it's you know how optimized do you want it to be but yeah that's just one thing yeah so this check is about that the subnet name is correct the source is correct uh then we check that the messages cross mess if we have cross messages then they're sorted then we get a vote submission. So uh, I actually don't like naming here mm -hmm. this function. So, but uh, we have this uh, this uh, names of variables. So I, I I would use different names, but let's see. So here, uh, what what they do is that they get the history of votes that we have received so far for, for this net for this subnet so we have entire history of votes from different validators for different epochs and uh, as i said in a high, high level overview of the protocol the checkpoint 
So uh, there are many validators. They send uh, checkpoint messages, and uh, we consider that uh, validators can be malicious, and we need to have at least we, we need to have majority of votes to accept this checkpoint, propagate it, and execute all messages from this checkpoint. Right. So to to apply all this logic, we store votes, we store votes in the state, and uh, the information for that, I would say, I, I would use a context name, something like that, but okay, that's called votes, vote submission, okay. Uh, but the idea is that we get the context for voting, and we uh, implement that logic. Uh, process of voting logic here. Could we have a look at the epoch vote bottom up submission what what that struct is? Uh we did, right? Oh, it's this one. Okay, okay. So this has the epoch, the fee, all the okay. And it's linked to the previous hash, okay. Yeah. Uh so submit checkpoint and uh, sub submit bottom up vote and uh, the first First argument is a vote submission, and then other arguments, checkpoint, sender, and stake. And uh, what we do here is we check. We If this is the first submission, we create it and we store it. We identify this submits by submission hash, and we store that submission. And we will store all other votes here, correct? all other votes from different validators that this subnet actor will receive. Right, so am I, if I'm voting for that submission, I'm, I'm voting for the same submission, right? The same hash, so we don't need to update that mapping at all if I'm voting for something that has already been, there's a previous vote for it. Yeah, so this is hash and bottom-up checkpoint. Bottom-up checkpoint, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, then I imagine submit vote I imagine that does just some calculation if we've reached the threshold and stuff like that. Yeah, there is another function. Uh, so after that, we call to uh, meet checkpoint. So all logic will be here. Okay, so that's if we've reached the threshold, we decide that, okay, now we're ready to actually commit it. And then this, I imagine, will go into the gateway when we underscore commit checkpoint. And then in underscore submit vote, that's where we probably do the, the threshold. Sorry, we, we missed this uh, function call, right? Yeah, so yeah. The hash, then we call submit vote. Yeah, the, the most interesting logic is here. Uh, so what do we do? Uh, we have a vote, address, hash, wait. Wait is a stake, it's a stake actually, uh, epoch and Total weight. Okay, so vote is an epoch vote submission. We didn't look at that. And it has nonce. Yeah, so this is uh, aggregated. These are aggregated votes, right? So nonce, total submission weight, how many votes we have. So is this a vote for a singular submission? For one submission, we have this epoch vote submission struct, and inside of this struct, we have all of the different submitters and all of their different weights. Okay, great. And this, and the nonce, does that correspond with like the basically the amount of different submissions? Like, if there's n different submissions, will the nonce increment to n? Mm, no, I, I don't think so. The nonce is incremented if we can't choose the checkpoint or for any reason so if we if we reset a voting process then we start again and to recognize that we started it again we increment nodes each attempt to get a majority of votes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. So it's sort of like this is our second attempt. Attempt. Our third attempt. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, so nonce. If this is the first attempt, nonce is zero. If we, if there is a 
address. So here we check okay. whether we voted or not, if this validator has voted or not. Yeah, and for this for this attempt. Then we if if this validator has not voted yet, we signal that now it provided a vote. Submitter weight is a stake. We increase total submission weight. We do the same in the mapping. Then we calculate votes. Most we get the most voted weight and current voted weight. Update the submission. Most voted submission if this if statement is true. You know what's interesting is this this total submission weight on the vote that is like independent of whatever the nonce is. Yeah, probably we should reset it right in the same place when we increase the nonce, right? Oh yeah, I bet I bet you guys do do that. Okay. Yeah, I think in the reset function you guys. Yeah. So here yeah. we will do that. Okay. Can we actually have a look at the the vote struct again just to make sure we are resetting everything uh this struct or... great yeah exactly so the total submission weight and the most voted submission everything else depends on the nonce so that's fine okay yeah uh okay there is a so we get the status and depending on the status we return whether we should execute this vote or not or not and so should i go to this the this function yeah let's let's have a look at that i imagine that one's a shorter no <laughs> it's, oh, it's just it's just a bunch of comments <laughs> yeah uh, so it's in the same contract okay okay so this is just the threshold right yeah then, it's about it's voting and it also handles threshold cases h h cases yeah and this is a very important function right because it's about voting so here we uh use multiplication then we use division uh, not fancy math fortunately less or equal okay and so if we have enough votes we call it consensus reached we return consensus reach and then we return here if consensus reached then we return should execute vote uh, uh, should execute vote only if uh, this epoch is the next executable epoch you know what i'm wondering just looking at that initially is is it possible to push onto this executable queue several times for the same epoch like if it's for for several times when we call that submit function if it's not the next one to uh, if it's not is next executable epoch this function this yeah function. like could we get there several times oh i see we have q dot epochs uh, not what i was expecting uh, from q <laughs> I, I wonder why we have uh, this edge case epoch is zero mm -hmm. i mean i mean that why why is zero but not genesis epoch because there before that we in a initial checks and submit actor we here right there, there was a check uh, where, where was it that is uh, i think it was in the modifier right ah uh, yeah yeah correct valid epoch only uh, yeah and uh, here we require that epoch greater than genesis epoch but there more than if it's equal to zero then we revert yeah i think the ideal thing is to just not let anything less than the genesis and then you don't even need that or you could have epoch equals equals genesis or whatever that wants to be yeah. ah, okay yeah probably that's not about epochs actually so it shouldn't be called epochs or, or maybe not so i'm not sure do we have a relation to epochs here or not yeah so when we're pushing on to this what are what is it that we're pushing again uh epoch epoch uh you know voting executable epoch yeah push so, okay great so yeah the way that i'm thinking about this right now is we have this queue which is of things that are they have passed the majority vote right consensus has been reached and it's just not the next executable epoch because these things have to go in order right so i have to execute epoch one 
before I can execute Epoch 2, before I can execute Epoch 3, right? Yeah. So if we haven't yet executed Epoch 1, then we need to push it into the queue and mm -hmm. say, okay, there's a backlog of basically Epoch like vote submissions that have reached consensus that need to be executed. So yeah, my thinking is that if we if we did change that modifier, then we actually don't need that check. Yeah, but uh, when we push zero here, we don't because we require that epoch is greater, which should be greater than Genesis epoch. And even if Genesis epoch is zero, then epoch uh, must be greater than zero. So we don't push. We shouldn't push. Well, zero. right now, technically, right now, because of the way the modifier is, you you could get an epoch of zero to this point. Yeah, but that's a bug. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I, I think we could remove this if if that modifier was fixed. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But it also it does depend on um, the other places where because this is a library, right? So this is just one instance of where it's being used. So it also depends on other instances. But yeah, I'm trying to see. I'm trying to understand how this queue logic works here. So we have an executable queue, and we have a first, and we have a last, and then we have this big thing for removed because. <laughs> So what I'm thinking from like a high level, if if I pretend that I know how this this queue library works right now, and I just say, okay, it's like a classic queue. If we go back to the subnet actor contract in the function we were just looking at, let's see, or I think it was in the voting library. Sorry, yeah, right here. So like I was saying, like we have this queue. This is the way I'm thinking of it. We have this queue where, let's say, we weren't able to execute like any epochs for whatever reason. We're just backed up. So all of these consensus, like majority voted things are just building up in the queue, right? So what happens when, let's say there's epoch one that is waiting in the queue and then there's epoch two. Now this thing has reached consensus. So now I vote for it. Let's say I'm the voter that puts it over the threshold, right? So now we've reached consensus for the first time for this epoch two submission. We put this in the queue right here. Now, this hasn't been executed yet. It's also not the next executable epoch. Now, let's say a third person, Alice, comes along and they vote for this same vote submission. Are we going to then put it in the queue again so that we have epoch here at this place in the queue? Now we put something else at the end of the queue as well, which is for the same epoch. So could we end up with two epochs in the queue and... Is that a bad thing? Two of the same epochs in the queue. Yeah, but uh, U is for epochs that have been voted, right? So uh, the, there are two epochs, epoch number one, let's say four, and the next eight. And for some reasons, for some reasons, the epoch number eight was was uh, voted before epoch number four mm -hmm. and we pushed eight and then when all voted for epoch four then we push epoch four into queue right and we ex and then we first execute epoch number four and then epoch number eight so your question is what if, if i understood it correctly what protects protects q from having from having uh more than i would say correct order of epochs right so why we will still have the previous epoch in the queue if we get more votes for the next epoch Yes, that's that's one question I do have. But then also, let's say once something reaches consensus, I think this is more explicitly what I'm trying to understand is once, let's say, Epoch 8 reaches consensus mm -hmm. and we put it in the queue, how are we making sure that nobody else votes for Epoch 8? Because if I now come along and vote for Epoch 8 again with a different address, somebody else comes in and votes for it. Now we're going to put it in the queue again. So Epoch 8 would be in the queue two times. But, but, but how is it possible that uh, somebody voted for Epoch 8? Because Epoch 8 has majority of votes. So I, gu I guess it depends on the definition of majority. So let's say that there are 10 validators and they each have a weight of one. And the majority is 
seven out of 10, right? Okay. So yeah. if I'm the seventh person voting, I'm that person who puts it in the queue for the first time. We reach consensus when I vote for it, right? Uh, no, we we don't put voters in the queue. We yeah, the, the the epoch. So I'm the person that sets the epoch that that vote submission. It reaches over the majority when I vote for it, right? Yeah. So epoch number eight has seven votes. Yes, exactly. It's and in that, the queue, all right. Yeah, and at that point, it gets put in the queue, right? Okay, it's in the queue, and now uh, somebody else comes and they vote for the same thing, and now we're at eight. Does it what, get put in the queue again? What do you mean by the same thing for the epoch number eight or what? Yeah, so seven seven people have voted for this vote submission, right? For epoch number eight. Yes, exactly for this vote and submission we, for this epoch. There are all that information that they have voted for the epoch number eight yeah exactly exactly there are three people who haven't voted yet okay what happens when one of those bonus three people comes and they vote for that same submission again but uh, they will not get majority of votes because the majority is seven well they're they're voting for the same submission that already had already had majority and i'm thinking you would want to say no more voting for something that already has majority or just say don't put it in the queue again okay let's let's check the uh, can you show me how how is it possible in the code because i yeah absolutely absolutely so this is this is just an idea so so what's this if we scroll up what's the the function called so this is an internal function Submit so, right so so if i'm Let's pretend, let's walk through it. Let's say I'm the seventh voter, right? So we, we can actually like walk through it line by line. Yeah. So so let's say I'm the seventh voter. I'm the person who will put this vote over the threshold to reach consensus, right? Mm -hmm. So what's going to happen is we're going to add my submitter weight, right? It's going to be, you know, sure we have, let's say there's only one, one um, submission for this epoch, just to make it simple, right? There's only one submission for this epoch. Six people have already voted for this submission. Uh -huh. I'm the seventh person. Mm -hmm. Now when I vote, the vote execution status on line 141 is consensus is reached, right? Uh -huh. Now, so we go into that if statement on line 143. You mm -hmm. say, okay, let's say for the sake of this example, is next executable epoch, that's false. So we, we go into the queue. So it gets pushed in the queue. Great. Right. So that's all fine. Now what happens when, remember, there are three people who have yet to vote for this epoch, uh -huh. who are active validators for, for this epoch. Uh -huh. What happens when one of those three people comes and they vote for this same submission, they're now the eighth person. So now, sure, they go through, they add their weight to the submission. They do that. That's fine. We derive execution status. The derived execution status is still consensus reached because now we, we are at eight out of 10, right? I believe what could happen, we'll have to see, is that let's say it's, it's still not the next executable epoch. So we go to add it to the queue for a second time. What about this? Uh, so most voted weight they're the same right yeah that would be like still the the same submission right and then we derive the the status it would still be like consensus reached right because i've just added a vote to something that was previously already consensus reached so we're greater than the threshold there still yeah up obviously and uh voting okay and so we Push it again, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And so I I don't know how the queue works internally if it doesn't allow you to do this, but is it possible for, you know, if we're going to push something to the queue twice, if it's a canonical queue, then now we have two epochs. It's the same epoch, but it's in the queue twice. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so when we push it first time, first time, contains remove so, oh, when, so, we, so we have that contains check so <laughs> that no, answers the question right there yeah no it, it checks on remove oh on, on remove yeah it checks that's right 
only only so in on push there is no content so if we if we call push first time then we epoch is not zero eq first is not zero last ah no q first is zero right by default by default okay. if first zero and epoch is eight we miss that right i think we we would go in there right because it's an or no q, q first is zero and epoch is so q first now is eight and uh, q last is eight and uh, q ah q epochs epoch is true now all right yeah so then that's how we we get the contains to work i guess it, it comes down to when we remove do we remove all instances yeah but but then if we call push eight twice we we will not change anything all right let's see because q first will be eight and q last will be also eight so that's in the in the simplest case right yes but yeah. there's <laughs> there are also cases where eight is not the first nor the last yeah so now if we have this mapping is it map yeah is it mapping i believe should we check this whether we have pushed this at e epoch or not yeah no. like have a contains oh. check at the beginning or something of that sort that also changes somewhat i mean the the canonical idea of a queue is that it's not like a set and it's fine to to have multiple of the same thing so yeah i think this is this is exactly something that it's like an edge case that i would definitely write down and come back to later because we also have to take into account how is the queue library being used throughout the code base right not just here but yeah i'm sorry for taking us down that <laughs> that rabbit hole all right that is all for this time we've learned a lot a ton about this checkpointing logic here in this episode and we're starting to get a clearer picture of how the whole code base fits together and how this actually works in practice and so in the next episode we're going to continue to dig deeper and understand this idea of subnet actor communication on a deeper level and keep trying to uncover bugs with the system and of course, if you are on a team building a new, cool, innovative DeFi project, then of course, I want to hear about what you're building. In fact, I want to hear about it so much that if you actually go to guardianaudits.com slash quote, I'll happily do a first pass initial review of things that ought to get fixed before you go into an audit, any surface level issues or glaring vulnerabilities when you submit an application at guardianaudits.com slash quote. And of course, if you happen to know anybody looking for a smart contract audit, then of course, send them to guardianaudits.com slash quote. And of course, if you're really interested in this security auditing stuff and you want to take your game to the next level and you'd like to meet others around the world who are also interested in leveling up their game and even potentially compete in team audits where you team up with others across the world and conduct a real audit of a real code base and even get rewarded for your findings then go ahead and apply to join our free community at lab.guardianaudits.com okay that is all for this time i cannot wait to see you in the next one